This morning I'd like to invite my friend Reg Shute, which you, most of you know Reg. Uh, Reg uh, was a major part of this church for a while and then uh, realized the drive, an hour drive here from Brantford is a long ways to make this your local church. So uh, uh, when you ever you do come, we love having you guys here. And Maureen, great to have you here as well. Um, Reg is going to share this morning from his heart. And uh, I'm so glad to finally have him back up here sharing at Hope Fellowship. Reg, will you come? Well, good morning. Well, that was interesting how about half the congregation just walked out. <laughs> Boy, you know how to give me some warm and fuzzies, don't you? So I see you've extended the dance floor since I was up here last. That's nice. It almost makes me feel like, but no, let's not go there. I have what they call white man's syndrome. Yeah, I can't dance. <laughs> the music is in me, but the rhythm is not. So, anyways, do we have a PowerPoint? Everyone cross your fingers. <laughs> it's coming. I entitled uh, the message this morning, Fencing Sovereignty. Fencing Sovereignty. It's uh, something that's been on my heart for several months, actually. It's been a little bit of a journey that I've been on, so um, it's really cool that I get to actually share it with everyone here at Hope. Uh, what is sovereignty? I know we're going to, it sounds kind of complex and whatnot, but we'll, we'll get you through this. I mean, you almost saw me bust move up here, so it can't be any worse than that, right? <laughs> so, what is sovereignty? It's a word that we don't use a whole lot anymore here in North America. Um, something that, you know, the, the countries that still have their monarchies in place still use a lot more than we do, per se. But uh, what, does, what does it mean? Sovereignty, according to the uh, at dictionary.com, says this. It's the quality or state of being sovereign or of having supreme power or authority. It's the state, status, dominion, power, or authority of a sovereign, royal rank, or position, royalty, supreme and independent power, or authority in government as possessed or claimed by a state or community, and rightful status, independence, or prerogative. Merriam-Webster adds this, it's a supreme power, freedom from external control, and a controlling influence. Now historically, and I'm not talking about the last couple hundred years, I'm talking about thousands of years here, okay? So historically, it was normal for a country to have a king who was considered a, a sovereign king. So a country was normally ruled many, many years ago by a king who basically was the ultimate authority of the country. He called all the shots right down to the point where the king would normally determine the laws of the land and also the consequences for breaking those laws. Now a lot of those laws were probably very simplistic in nature, probably could even relate in some respects to the Ten Commandments on, on some level or some sort like that. I mean, let's face it, the Ten Commandments are also pretty simplistic because uh, you've basically got, you know, don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, uh, don't be jealous of your neighbor, although that's probably not a law that most countries adopt. But uh, the Ten Commandments are fairly simplistic, and it would uh, be reasonable to assume that most laws thousands of years ago would be pretty simplistic. But a lot of the times, the consequences for breaking those laws were pretty severe. But what we come back to is the fact that the king, being sovereign, basically ran the show. He determined all these things. But here's a question. Is the king and his family, being royalty or sovereignty, if you will, are they subject to the consequences for breaking the laws? When's the last time you saw royalty being arrested and charged with a crime? Never. Never. Although, <laughs> there was a thing in the news a couple weeks ago that kind of blew that theory on me because apparently one of the royalty uh, members of the family in Spain is, is being charged with tax evasion. But anyways, 
<laughs> I'm talking historically here, okay? So let's just ignore that. <laughs> so, realistically, sovereignty, are they subject to the consequences for breaking the law or aren't they? Maybe on paper, who knows? In reality, I would say no. Right? We'll just kind of hang on to that thought for now. But, here's the thing. And this is part of my journey, is that when somebody is taken from a place, let's, let's put it into an employment kind of frame of mind. <clears throat> if you start off at your place of work, down at the bottom of the totem pole, as we all would, if you start off there, and your place of employment gives you all kinds of rules and regulations that you must follow, and probably a lot of them are health and safety related, probably many of them are to do with how production is done where you work, and they give you all these lists of do's and don'ts. A lot of times, at that level of employment, people tend to try and dodge some of these rules, kind of like, why do I have to do this? You know, like, it's, there's some murmuring that goes on a lot of times. Now, if you take that same person and you promote them into a place of management, what happens with their attitude towards these rules? A lot of times it goes the other way. Because now they begin to see the importance of having these things in place. It's for our protection and it's for the betterment of your employer, which signs your paycheck, right? So here's the thing. When people are put into positions of authority, uh, many, many times, in fact, I'm going to say pretty much all the time, their actual thought process changes. They get a different mindset than they normally would have had they been at the other end of the spectrum. Okay? So let's just hold on to that thought for a moment. Get back to our king. Now this guy, I like this guy, because he reminds me of King David. Don't ask me why, I'm not really sure, other than in my mind, I think King David is like a boy king. Although he's not, he was very wise, uh, very much given to the battlefield, but I think in his heart he was a boy king. So, here we are with the king, and he is the ultimate authority in the country. He is looking out for the best interest of his people. He's the one that determined the laws of the land. So you have to, to believe that if he determined the laws of the land, those laws probably reflect his, his own conscience, you know, his, his, what he thinks is right and wrong. So he set out all these guidelines for everyone. But then with everything being so simplistic, Something had to happen because there was too many variables. So in comes the politician, okay? Because, let's face it, you can't just walk up to the, to the door of the castle and knock on it and expect the king to come, say, yeah, come on in, what do you need, right? So in, in comes the politician. And the politician becomes the go-between between the people and the king. And he starts to ask questions. So what kind of questions are they? Probably a lot of it is questions concerning the law. Because remember, the laws are very simplistic. And the consequences for breaking the laws are pretty straightforward and probably harsh. And there's still a lot of countries that are like that today. You know, there's countries still in this world where if you steal a piece of bread or a piece of fruit or something, they'll actually cut your hand off. That still exists today. And it's probably the way it's been for many thousands of years. So anyways, the politician comes in and he starts addressing some of these things. Maybe we can get more definition, you know, what happens if, let's say, uh, somebody dies in some kind of a, a situation where, is it murder? Is it self-defense? Is it an accident? Did I hire somebody to do it for me? You know, there's all kinds of things that that were not set out in the diverse way that the simplistic laws were. So along comes the law of society. So then the law of society begins breaking this all down. And they begin determining, and let's put it in a modern day vernacular, if somebody were to steal a $70,000 Mercedes Benz, and another guy were to steal a $1,200 winter beater, is it considered the same crime with the same punishment? And I believe here in Canada, it's not considered the same crime or the same punishment. But these were the kinds of things that people were questioning and trying to deal with. Um, 
Maybe it's to try and get the law to be more fair. I don't know. I do believe, though, that a lot of these laws that are designated as the lesser laws on the lower end of the scale with lesser consequences are really more there for um, society to catch those people in those minor acts before they progress to the point where they're, they're committing the big stuff, right? So in a way, you could say that those, those minor things, what the law calls misdemeanors, would be more like what we refer to from biblical standards as fence laws. They're trying to stop you on the little things before you get to the big things, okay? Which leads me to where I was going. What is the first, what is the result on society as far as the king is concerned and his sovereignty? Well, what happens is the law steps in and starts making all these rules and regulations and takes away from the king his sovereignty. I mean, you can, you can even use England, for instance, in modern day England as an example. Does anyone actually know why they still have a monarchy? Because they, they can exist without it, right? They can exist without it. But they love their monarchy. And I'm not judging them for that. That's, that's fine. But what I'm saying is, the law of society comes in and it takes away the authority and sovereignty of the king. Or in this case, the queen in England. All right? So what happens when the law does that, when it takes away the sovereignty of the king? You have this. You have the king with a fence around him. The king behind the fence. His hands are tied, right? Because his sovereignty has been taken away. Now let's kind of step that over into biblical terms. What are we talking about here, really? Because I'm sure you didn't really need this history lesson for no reason, right? Where we take this into, into the, the spiritual side of things is years ago, we started off, and it's kind of a loose term, we, because I'm really talking about Jews and we're mostly Gentiles here, but anyways, this is our roots, okay? We started off with what we call an Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic covenant, I don't know if you, you know, there's actually three covenants. I always thought there was two, but there's actually three. The first covenant was the Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic covenant was actually sort of a type of grace-based covenant, right? Because the Abrahamic covenant did not have rules and regulations and laws that, that he had to follow. It was more based on what we know today as walking after the Spirit. Now, I don't believe that all the particulars are the same between that covenant and where we are now, because when Christ died on the cross, that put in a whole different dynamic. But the Abrahamic covenant, covenant was more like a grace-based type of covenant, where all these rules and regulations and the onus to follow them was not put on Abraham and his family. So then what happens is Abraham's family grew to the point where they became a big nation. And now you're talking not just a few people, you're talking millions of people. I forget what the stats are, but there's something, there's well over a million people that were involved in the exodus out of Egypt. And I don't know, I might be wrong, but I think it was like four million or something like that. But anyways, it was a pile of people. So now you've got this big nation all of a sudden. So you've got many, many people who are trying to figure out what is this, what we would now call walking after the spirit business. We don't understand this. What's going on here? And so what they said was, well, God, if you would just write this all, all down, all the stuff we need to do and follow, then we'll take over from there. We'll just, we'll just live all this and we'll be good. And everything's fine. Well, what happened there, really? Well, really what happened was, in their minds, their king just came off the throne. Because the law society just stepped in. And so... What happened was, the king that they knew as being sovereign, which the Old Testament refers to as Lord with a capital L, and we know now from, from study that when you see Lord in the Old Testament with a capital L, it's talking of Jesus. A lot of people don't think Jesus is in the Old Testament, but that's who he is, Lord with a capital L. So now Jesus, in the people's minds, lost his sovereignty and came off the throne. Okay? So then, 
what happened was they, they found out that it became much more difficult to follow God's ways, to walk after God, than it was before they had the law. I mean, who would think that it's so hard to keep a law that says don't kill anyone, right? Who would think it's so hard to keep a law that says don't steal from anyone? They're pretty simplistic laws, let's face it. But the reality is, it became more and more difficult for them for, to follow these things. And so what they did was they decided that they would start setting up what we call now fence laws. Some of them call them hedge laws, we call them, uh, I call them fence laws. And what these fence laws were uh, meant to do was to keep people at bay. It, it gave them smaller laws to focus on, lesser laws to focus on, more menial things to focus on. That would have, they would have to break that to get to the big things that God set in front of them. As in, don't do this, right? And so they decided to set up all these fence laws. And, and it got to the point where it was really, really ridiculous. Like, the list of God's laws were maybe this long on paper. The list of the fence laws that the Jews set up was probably like this long, right? Because there was something like 613 of God's laws in its entirety. And there was well over a couple thousand laws that the Jews put in place to try and keep them at bay from breaking God's laws. And these laws got so crazy and so out of control, there's actually a law, believe it or not, that relates to keeping the Sabbath holy, as many people misinterpreted that as you can't work on Sunday then. That's not what the law meant. It meant to keep it holy. And so, uh, actually Jesus addressed that when he said, you know, if your donkey falls in a ditch on the Sabbath, who's here is not going to go fish him out? Right? Jesus said, you know, you're going to work, but we've got to keep it holy. Right? And so, there's a law that the Jews made up, believe it or not, that says that on the Sabbath, you cannot spit into the dust because that will make mud, and making mud on the Sabbath is not holy. Right? This is how crazy these fence laws get. So, anyways... The king in their minds is off the throne. They're making up all these crazy laws. And then what happens? Well then, Christ comes, comes here, is born of a virgin, God incarnate, and he does what he needs to do to get this all straightened out again. In other words, he takes the law, he takes sin and death, and he nails it to the cross, and it's all done away with. He fulfilled the law, it's done away with. It's all done. And he creates a new covenant. So then, guess what happens? In our minds, Christ is on the throne again. Right? Christ is sovereign again. And I want to I stress that this is in our minds, because this is not reality, right? This is in our minds, the way we think about these things. Because Christ was never off the throne. It was just what we conceived, or perceived. So Christ is on the throne again. And then we have... All this instruction through the epistles in the, in the New Testament that are instructions to who? Well, primarily to the Christians, but we have to also understand that these were transitional Christians. These were people who lived under the old law, and then they needed instruction on how to get out from under that old law and get into the new covenant way of living, right? And so then what happens is, these people have this great instruction. They start understanding what it means to walk after the Spirit. And as generations keep going by and keep going on and on, what happens, same thing that happened to the nation of Israel. It was eventually people started saying, you know what? I can't figure this all out. I don't understand all this walking by after the Spirit business. What's this all about? And so we start creating fence laws. Right? primarily in our churches. And it falls under the heading of religion. And basically, what it boils down to is we have all these, what we call Christian rules and regulations. I'm sorry, Christian rules and procedures. <laughs> and if you know Pastor Mike and sat under him, he uses this, this all the time, right? So we have all this crap, okay? They all fall under Christian rules and procedures. And so then what happens 
is once again, in our minds, in our way of thinking, our king has been dethroned again. Because now we're living under laws again. Right? Some of the Christian community still believes in uh, the old Mosaic law where you know, we have the Ten Commandments and one not still in place. Um, we don't. That was done away without the cross. But a, a lot of people, just like the Israelites years ago, said, you know, I, I don't understand this walking after the spirit business. So, so how, do, how, do we, how do we do this? And so they keep going back to the old law. Now, when it comes to who we are, what our identity is, this is something that, that I journeyed on a little bit a few years ago, and I actually said I was going to write a paper on it, and I never got that far yet, but it's interesting because do you realize that the Bible calls each and every one of us sons of God? Now, here's, here's the, the crux of it, is that a lot of people think that if you accept Christ, believe in Christ, then you are a child of God. But the reality is, the Bible refers to mankind as his children. Okay? Everyone is sons of God. This is mentioned in the Bible in Genesis, in Psalms, even in Luke 3.38, several other areas in the Bible, we are talked about as the sons of God. And so we are all God's children. Which basically, uh, some people would say that makes Jesus like our big brother. Right? And Timothy says that Jesus is the king of kings. He is sovereign. I mean, being king over all other kings, I think that classifies as sovereign, right? Now, if we are the sons and children of God, brothers to Christ, joint heirs with Christ, right? Then what does that make us? That makes us sovereign, right? If we are part of the royal family, and we inherit everything that Christ has inherited, then we are sovereign. Okay? So here's the crux of this. These two people in here, and I'm sure you recognize it off a series on television, but anyways. These two people here behind this fence is us. Kings and queens locked in behind a fence. Our hands are tied. We are sovereign, but we're tied by these Christian rules and procedures, right? I got myself into a lot of trouble years ago. Um, I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> I've settled down a lot lately. Um, but anyways, I got myself into a lot of trouble with the church I attended years ago because I started questioning these Christian rules and procedures, these fence laws that we put in place, because I didn't understand. I, I read the Bible, and, I'd, and then I'd look at our church doctrine, and i think, okay, it's not lining up. What's going on here? And then I kind of tackled my pastor on it, and he didn't appreciate it, and here I am. Uh, I, I hope I found a place that appreciate, appreciates it now, but anyways. I was finding out as I was getting older that this doctrine wasn't lining up. And partly that, but what really opened my eyes to a lot of things was the fact that as I was getting older and I got to an age of, say, 19 or 20, and we know that, what that means in Canada here. You, you're allowed to do things you couldn't do when you're 18, right? Uh, I didn't do that much. <laughs> but anyways, I started finding out that a lot of people in our church who were of most of the ethnic background of Italian would start, I, I start understanding that they all had these wine cellars, right? I mean, no good Italian would be without a good wine cellar with his own homemade wine, right? And I started finding out things like this, and I start comparing this to to these agreements that we signed to take out church memberships, and it says abstain from alcohol, period. Okay? Didn't say don't get drunk, said abstain from alcohol, period. And so I started kind of questioning these things, and what really got me is a lot of these, these friends of mine in the church were actually deacons of the church with their wine cellars going against what they agreed to to be a member of the church. So I started asking a lot of questions, and... Uh, 
Maybe I wasn't real smart about the way I went about it, but anyways, it happens, right? So, so here we are with, with all these Christian rules and procedures that we're trying to follow that don't line up with God's Word. And the thing is, you know what, if you want to go to a church who has all these procedures and everything, that's fine. But what I'm saying is, as long as we understand what's biblical doctrine and what's church doctrine, right? Because the thing is, a lot of times church doctrine gives us a false impression of who God is and gives us, gives us a, a false impression of what our freedoms in Christ are because Christ literally set us free from everything. Do you know that when I said that, that Jesus nailed sin and death to the cross, you know what that means? That means there's no more sin. It's dead. And if you believe Hebrews 10 verse 2, it says that we actually do not have any more conscience of sin. Now, I just opened up a big old can of worms there that Pastor Mike's going to have to try and sort out. <laughs> but the reality is, and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not pushing this anywhere or pointing fingers at anything or anyone, only to say that there's a lot more freedom, a lot more that resulted on the cross than what we understand. And where, where is our lack of understanding? It's up here, right? I'll be the first one to admit it. Like, I got issues up here sometimes, right? Because up here doesn't always jive with what's down here. And so these are things that are part of the journey, trying to sort this all out. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about deep calling to deep. And I got stuck on that for a long time, trying to figure that out. I mean, yeah, it's God calling to us, but what does it really, really mean? You know? And I got stuck on it. And I, I've meditated on that for a while, trying to figure out what does that all mean? And I've come to understand that what's in our spirit is far deeper than what's in our understanding. And deep, God calls out to those deep things in us and brings it to the surface little by little as we can begin to comprehend and learn more and learn more. That's what we call a journey. So if sin was nailed to the cross, and sin is no more, and that's, that's what the Bible says, and do I understand all that? Because the reality is, do we still sin? I'm not that perfect in and of myself, in my natural man, to not sin. But sin is, is gone, done away with, according to Scripture. Okay? So what about these consequences we talked about for uh, the sovereign family of all these uh, countries where the consequences for breaking the laws that, that that family put in place applying to them if they in fact broke them and keep in mind that they have a different mindset too if they set the laws they're probably going to enforce them but that being said Romans 4.15 says where there is no law there is no transgression the mirror puts it this way if there is no law there is nothing to break. There's no contract. There's no breach. Now, does the law still exist? I'm not talking about the laws of Canada here, right? I'm talking about the spiritual laws, old covenant laws, right? Do those laws still exist? Scripture says they were nailed to the cross. They were done away with, right? So there is no more, if you want to refer to it as spiritual laws, old covenant laws, Whatever makes sense to you, if you want to refer it to that way, they're gone. Okay? Now, if they're gone, then Romans tells us if there's no law, there's no sin. Because you can't break a law that doesn't exist. And sin is breaking a law. Right? So, man, it's awfully quiet in here. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. You know what? It's, a, it's amazing, right? Because to, to think this all through, that there is no law, which means that if there's no law, there's nothing to break. So if you can't break anything, then there's no sin. And yet, we do sin, right? Well, 
that's another complex subject, and I'll just kind of let you take that home with you and kind of chew on that, but I don't have time to try and break that one all apart today. But anyways, I just want to get you thinking about, you know what, there's deeper truths that are found both in God's Word and both in our spirit. There's deeper truths than what we fully understand. And, you know, God gives us a lot of patience. I mean, we have all the patience we need, right? That's through the Spirit. But I tell you what, when I see some things posted on Facebook, man, I want to respond to them in the worst way. <laughs> but I know that what will happen is the love of God will not emanate through my fingers into the keyboard. In fact, I posted something this morning about what is wisdom, which is basically, how did I put it? It's our uh, willingness to, to accept that we don't know everything. And it's our willingness to accept that what we do know may be riddled with error. And it's our willingness to accept the fact that we need to be continually on a journey of discovering truth. In my mind, that's wisdom. Right? I don't have all the answers. I don't think I've met anyone who has, except, of course, Pastor Mike. He's a great guy. <laughs> um, but, you know what? We're all in the same boat. We're all on a journey. We're all learning. Right? But, I'll tell you what. This whole business of there is no more law, there's no more consciousness of sin, that is out there. Even for me. Okay? That is out there. But it is also scriptural. So, I don't proclaim to understand it all, but I will say this, that when I was really, really tied up in a lot of church doctrine and whatnot, this is what was happening. Was I was trying to push God into a box, right? So, here's, I'll tell you a story. Back when I was maybe 14 or so, my pastor was delivering a message, and one of the things he said was, we've put God in a box, now you need to take him out. And for years, and I mean years, probably into my mid-twenties, at least, maybe longer, maybe thirty even, I thought, I kept re re recounting this, this thought that I need to take God out of the box, and I kept thinking to myself, what would happen? What would it look like if I took God out of the box? And for, man, that's got to be 15, 20 years. You, you know how you, you envision things, right? Like, you may think, oh, this is going to happen tomorrow, and you kind of think it through, and you have this preconceived idea of how things might go, and, you know, we all do this, right? Where we all envision something that's going to be coming up, and envisioning how things are. Do you know that in the maybe 20 years that I kept wondering what it would look like if I took out of the box, I never ever was able to envision anything that, that I could understand as God coming out of the box. I couldn't envision anything. And it was perplexing. And I couldn't understand why. And so then what started happening was I started gaining a little bit of a mild interest in documentaries on things in outer space. Things in the universe, galaxies, stars. And as I started watching these things, I, I began to become amazed at the scale of things. And I began, when, when they were showing images of the, that the Hubble telescope is bringing back, and they're showing these galaxies that are literally trillions and trillions of miles away, and the size and scope of these things just started blowing my mind. I, I just couldn't understand how big things were, you know, because my mind was, was so finite with, you know, the confines of in this world type of thing, right? I mean, it's hard for me to understand little bits and pieces of, you know, different societies and different cultures, and I mean, t I, couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around a lot of that stuff, and here I am now all of a sudden being blown away by the scale and size of everything out there in the universe. And I started thinking to myself, you know what, like, God is so big. It's just unbelievable. And I, I heard things like, there's, scientists see a new star created at least every minute of the day. And this is the stuff they see, right? What's, this, what's going on that they don't see? 
And just about maybe two weeks ago, I saw this um, documentary, documentary that was showing two complete galaxies. Now you know what a galaxy is, right? That's, that's like we're in the Milky Way galaxy. That's where our, our planet is and our sun and, and the other planets that are in our solar system are in our galaxy. Well, there's other complete galaxies out there in the universe. We're not the only one. And I saw this picture the other day of these two galaxies that came together. Now think about this. The scale of all this is amazing. And when these two galaxies came together, there was uh, the collision actually created, scientists believe, about a billion new stars. A billion, okay? And so I'm looking at the scale of all this stuff and I'm thinking, my goodness. Of course, to put things in time frame perspective, like God doesn't, he's not in time, he's out of time. But to put things in time frame perspective, I got to think to myself, I could just envision God getting up in the morning and saying, what should I do today? Jesus is like, I don't know, what do you feel like? Well, I don't know, I made like a billion stars yesterday, what's there left to do? Um, I got it. You see those two galaxies over there? I'm going to push them together and see what happens. <laughs> so then he, then he goes ahead and then gives a little swirl with his finger, because that's what the picture looks like, right? Get a little swirl and... And then, hey, hey Jesus, hey, look, look what I did here. That is freaking awesome. <laughs> look at that. Right? Like the scale and scope of all the stuff that goes on. How could we ever put God in a box? That is why I couldn't envision what would happen if I took him out. Because I never put him in to begin with. Right? So what's happening here? I'm in the box. Right? I'm in the box. When I got this revelation, it was like, my goodness, all these years I've been trying to take God out of the box, and He wasn't in the box. I was. Right? And it took something out of, let's say, technology for me to understand this, because I didn't get this revelation out of God's Word. I got this revelation by watching documentaries on television. But... Once I started opening my mind to just how big God is, and that I was the one in the box, then it opened my mind to say, hey, I don't understand everything. I don't get it all. I've got errors in my understanding. I'm going to go back to God's Word, and I'm going to start studying and try to get a better handle on this and try to figure this out. Now, we're never going to figure it out, but little by little, deep calls to deep and calls this stuff out of us and we been, begin to expand our understanding. So it's not God that's in the box, it's us. It's not God that's trapped behind that fence in that picture I showed, it's us. We get trapped behind these things, behind these fences, and we don't understand it, we don't see it. You know the old, uh, the old saying, can't see the forest for the trees? because we're right in the middle of it, we can't see it. And we get all these things in front of us that become fences, and they take away our sovereignty in our minds. They take away our sovereignty. And just when we think that we've jumped that fence or we tore down that piece of fence, and we start going for a good old run and start blowing out the cobwebs, all of a sudden we get this, oh, what was that? Well, what that is, actually, it could be a wall. In my mind, what that is, you ever see those uh, invisible fences you can get for your pets? <laughs> you know, you, you bury, bury a wire and put the shock collar on them? Well, that's kind of what happens, I think, sometimes, is, is we get a piece of this, this big old fence in front of us torn down, and we start running across the field, and an invisible fence kind of pops up on us, right? And we're like, oh, I didn't realize I still was hanging on to that. It takes a long time for us to come out of that way of thinking, to unlearn some of those old things that were in error. It takes a long time. And these things sometimes catch us off guard. But the amazing thing is, God is big. God is awesome. God wants you to understand His ways in the ever so limited capacities that we can. And I'm speaking to myself here as much as anybody else. But there's just so much more 
for us to grab a hold of, so much more for us to learn, so, so much more for us to understand. And I think it's very important that we understand we need to live outside the box. First off, we have to recognize that we are in the box, and then we need to learn how to live out of the box. And that's the crux of the journey I've been on for a while now. It's been an interesting journey. I've been learning a lot. It's been really amazing. But I'll tell you what, as much as I believe I've learned, I still get hit with that shock collar from time to time. <laughs> and I, I don't re realize that there's things that I just keep holding on to and keep holding on to. And God is good. God is gracious. God is patient and gentle. And he keeps expanding our knowledge, expanding what our understanding of things, and we begin to see that God is so much bigger than what we ever realized. All right? Thank you. I got, I got a question for you, Reg. Yeah. So, if you guys heard the very beginning of his message, I don't know if you remember this, but you said if, if you're just an employee mm -hmm. and you get the rules given to you, uh, it, it gets all, oh, I don't want to do this, and you find ways to break the rules. So what happens then if you actually believe you're sovereign? What happens to all this stuff? Yeah, it just changes everything. It changes your whole walk, perspective. Um, do you want to break those rules, though? <laughs> Here, here's the, you know what they say, when in Rome, right? <laughs> no, but, but one thing that Reg and I have done for the last number of years is we've been discovering that uh, godliness does not lead us to sinful actions. Because the more you believe your identity, that's what I heard just now. Mm -hmm. It's like, when you know you're sovereign, your mindset changes. Like when you get promoted, your mindset changes to what you think were controls, and you see purpose for things. Well, there's, thing, there's things that when we were growing up and you've got all these limitations, and, and this is where the, my kind of vernacular of the politician steps in, is where, um, uh, if I were to be totally honest, my perception of who the politician is, is the legalist. Because the legalist constantly is asking, what can I get away with? They're, they're continually looking at the rules and they're saying, how much latitude do I have here? What can I do and still be sinless? Or what can I do and still be acceptable in God's sight? What can I do and still gain God's favor? That's the politician, a.k.a. legalist. And so when you begin to understand your identity, you begin to understand... Christ's identity in you, you begin to understand that you are also sovereign, right? Then you lose that perception or that constant questioning of what can I get away with? It's no longer, I don't need to get away with all that stuff, right? Because the reality is, is gone. you realize that there is no more law. There's nothing to break. It takes the fun out of breaking something that isn't there, right? <laughs> so there's nothing left to break. And it changes our whole perspective and everything. It changes our mindset, changes, changes the way we think, what we do. And all of a sudden, it's like, you know what? There's nothing left to do but explore my relationship with Christ. That's awesome. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Reg. Did you have that gulp in your throat when he declared you were sovereign? Like, wait a minute. That, that, can't, that can't be true. It's so true, but it may not mean what you think it means. It's better than that. We're saints who sometimes sin, right? We're not sinners, because sinner, calling ourselves sinners is a, an identity statement. You know, it's like going to a garage and calling yourself a car. How dumb is that? You know. Anyway, thank you, Reg. That was fantastic. <laughs>